بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد الله وصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد from last week does anyone remember what hadiths we just we we uh, discussed last week the one by the one by Ali Allah describing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what are some of the things we discussed about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we started off with the general description yeah after that what did we discuss about the Prophet what attribute of his hair his hair what did we say about his hair from the shoulders what is the earlobe's hair called? Juma. Juma? Anyone else? Earlobes. Hair to the earlobes. What is it called? I should have bought those Daisy brownies. Wafra. <laughs> From earlobe till the shoulders in between. What is it called? Juma. Juma tomorrow. Limma. <laughs> Limma. And to the shoulders? Jumma. Jumma. What else did we say about the hair about the Prophet? What color, how many white strands of hair did the Prophet have? 18. 14, 14 and 20. 14, 17, 18, 20. Right? Where was the white hair located? Beard and? Beard and? And temple. I had the opportunity to go many places where people said that they had the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From Top Copy Museum in Istanbul to people's homes. There was one man though. His claim for the Prophet's hair was the strongest that I had seen. And there's a reason. was because besides the fact that he had a chain for it, besides that fact, besides the fact that he was one of the top scholars of South Africa, besides that, Besides the fact that he swore to Allah and said that for 30 years I never put a drop of itar on there. And when he opened, from my own eyes I see this, when he opened the, he wouldn't show it to everybody. Uh, but because that scholar was very good friends with my father. He opened the top, and his grandson was actually my classmate. He opened the top, he said, Wallahi, for 30 years I never put a drop of itar on there, or perfume. But when he opened the top, the room filled with fragrance. He had mentioned that that hair, he got from someone from England, who, the hair of the Prophet some gross. Right? It continues to grow. And he says that from the root, another strand was growing. So that person broke off from the root and gave it to him. But that's, that's beside the point. I'm not judging the man by his words. I remember in 2011, I believe it was, I went to Medina Munawwara. His name was Sheikh Yunus Patel. I met him in Medina Munawwara. We had a majlis. After every single day, he would have a class. <coughs> After Medina, he went to Mecca. I had to fly back to South Africa to give my exams for my Mufti course. And then I flew back to Mecca. So I went home for about, I went to South Africa for about a week. And then I came back. When I came back, obviously, while I was in South Africa for that week, he went from Medina to Mecca. Throughout this man's life, he had one dua. That, Ya Allah, I want to die in Medina. He had many chances of getting iqama or a green card for Saudi Arabia but it always required lying it always required fake papers, fake something so he, but it was through connections so he said I won't go to the Prophet's city by lying if I go, I go honestly so he would constantly get the visa, the whole procedure and whatnot. so the last well he, was in, he went from Medina to Mecca his last speech he gave in Medina Munawwara he began like this he said people say it's online as well he said people say all good things come to an end I say all good things and bad things, everything must come to an end. And then he began his speech, that was his final speech. He went, he went to Makkah Mukarramah, he did Umrah. After he did Umrah, he stood on top of the mountain of Marwa and he did Dua. He said, Ya Allah, if Medina is not destined for me, make Makkah destined for me. <laughs> the next day he did Tawaf before Maghrib Salah. He went around the Kaaba seven times. He prayed, he, the Adhan happened, then he prayed the Jama'at. After that, he went inside the haram, and then he came back down. As he came back down, he stood in front of the hatim, the area where, the, where the, there's a wall. He stood there, and he began doing dua. He did tawaf before Maghrib Salah, prayed Maghrib Salah, went into the building, came back out, stood by the hatim, did dua, and that is how Allah took his soul. In front of the Kaaba doing dua. At that time, they were not allowing anyone to get buried in Jannatul Mu'alla, any outsider. You have to be a Saudi. But because of his high position as a scholar, South African diplomats, you know, have you heard of Hashim Amla? The cricketer? Mm -hmm. The person who put Hashim Amla on track is this man. 
Sheikh Yunus Patel, I remember actually going inside his office in Durban and Hashim Amla was walking out. And then someone was like, you know who that is? And I was like, who? They're like, that's Hashim Amla. And I was like, what sport does he play? They're like, cricket. I was like, yeah, okay, we don't care about cricket. We're <laughs> Americans. <laughs> so I judged the man by the way he passed away. That's how I judged the man's words. Uh, and now that hair was passed down to his grandson. Not my classmate, my classmate's younger brother. Anyway. I just want to remark that story on the hair of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The next chapter is about the blessed antimony of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is antimony, not alimony. This is antimony in English, or, or in uh, Urdu or Arabic. Is in Arabic it's called kufr, and in Urdu it's called surma, and in English it's called antimony. Um, just to make it very clear, this is not eyeliner. So if you go home today and start grabbing your wife's eyeliner and says that I need, the, I need this MAC makeup for my eyes because I have to fulfill the sunnah, you'll be doing the opposite where Allah says don't be like, um, don't dress like women, right? You'll be doing the opposite then. Rasulullah, Ibn Abbas who says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said, the best from amongst all the kuhl, the best antimony, the best surma, the best from amongst all the kuhl used by you is the one made from ithmid. Ithmid is a certain type of kuhl. It brightens the eyesight, it strengthens the growth of the eyelashes. <coughs> it adds uh, volume to your eyelash and it extends and it makes your eyes stronger as well. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to apply kuhl every single night. Men apply it at night. Women can obviously, because they're, they're, they'll be at home or uh, surma, women put on eyeliners and for them it's different. But for men, they should not put it on in the morning and go, otherwise they will look like Kung Fu Panda when uh, they, they go to work. So they should apply it at night time before they go to sleep. The effect happens and then they wake up in the morning. Now, what is the sunnah? Abu Dawood narrates that Rasulullah used to put ithmid in his eyes an odd number of times. So the scholars have numerous opinions. And because I want to move on with the sabal, uh, with the class lessons, I don't want to go into details in any certain point. There are different opinions. One says that Rasulullah used to put it three times in his right eye, then three times in his left eye. In another opinion, the Prophet did one, 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 one. So three times, doing the right one, then the left one, the right one, the left one. Third opinion is the Prophet did one, twice, thrice. Right? So two times in the right eye, third, uh, one time in the left eye. And just like this, there are many opinions about it. You can do any of them. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, do it an odd number of times. It strengthens the vision. It makes the eyelash glows. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stressed the usage of ithmid. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's apparel, or as the class was called before they changed the name, the swag of the Prophet. <laughs> then they prophetic swag. Huh? Prophetic swag. The prophetic swag. And then they thought that I would be banned and everyone else who came up with the name would be banned. We changed the name. Abu Sa'id Khudr radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa put on a new garment. He would in happiness mention the garment's name. For example, Allah ta'ala gave me this qameez. Allah gave me this shawl. Allah gave me this hoodie. Allah gave me these Jordans. Then he would recite the dua. Allahumma lakal hamdu kama kasawtanihi. أَسْأَلُكَ خَيْرَهُ وَخَيْرَ مَا سُنِي عَلَهُ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ وَشَرِّ مَا سُنِي عَلَهُ O oh Allah, all praise and thanks are for you. For clothing me with this garment, I ask you for the good of it and the good of what it was made for. And I ask you your protection from the evil of it and the evil of what it was made for. There's a reason why the Prophet did this to him. Whenever you guys go shopping, Galleria, go to the mall, Black Friday sales, find some nice hoodies or some clothes, the first thing a person does is when they wear it, they feel proud. They have this sense of pride fills in your heart that, and I'm looking pretty fresh. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking good, right? You start looking at yourself, selfie time, selfie time, half an eye selfie, quarter eye selfie, right? One hair selfie, right? Behind the back. <laughs> um, so anyhow, so everyone starts, they, they, you admire yourself. You put on all these filters on Instagram, put yourself, you know, and then you hashtag no filter. <laughs> After that, uh, look for the best lighting. It brings a sense of pride. You see, Islam has one fundamental principle in it. And this is where I would say we clash to a certain degree with the West. And this principle, which is Islam stresses humility. 
thing that brother wants to see to give him some type of stuff that we have second album. Islam stresses on humility. On a person thinking, you see there's a difference between having high self-esteem and being, and being prideful. High self-esteem means that you are content with where you are. You are content. In high self-esteem, you have, you're, you're content. But in pride, you think you are better than the person next to you. That look, I'm rocking a Chanel bag. I'm rocking a Louis Vuitton pair of shoes. Look at that guy, he's wearing Payless. And the, he's, he got the, that's the second pair half off one too. Not even the original Payless. He got the second one on discount, right? And you automatically start feeling that I, I feel better about myself. There was one of my teachers, teacher Mufti Wali Hassan. This man was so conscious about himself that one time he was walking and he wore a nice white cloth, nice jubba, nice shirt, and he walked outside and he felt in himself that I'm feeling better about myself than other people. I'm having pride. So right away, he made some marks on his clothes to take away the beauty. Someone said, what are you doing? You just destroyed the whole pair of cloth. He said, no, this cloth was detrimental to me. It was because it made me feel better than the person next to me. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would constantly... I just went into the closet. <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam... I get distracted very quickly, so we're going to have to hurry up with this, with this chair. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would bring your mind, first of all, back in the day, clothes were a big deal. You know how nowadays uh, cars are a big deal, nowadays you have, uh, clothes don't mean anything. You can go to Walmart, you can go to Children's Wear, you can go to... Uh, what are other bootlegger clothes places here? FUBU. TJ Maxx. FUBU still exists? Oh, yeah. TJ Maxx, Marshalls, you can go anywhere. But in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, clothes were a big deal. It was because they weren't just manufactured, mass produced. There were people made them <clears throat> with their hands. They were expensive. Having a cloth, you gave someone a cloth uh, for their, for, for their uh, as a wedding gift. You gave it as, it was a big deal. To the point that there was this one Sahabi named Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Very long story, very long incident. But... When he was given the glad tidings of him being forgiven by Allah, the first thing he did was he gave his clothes. And then he was like, man, I don't even have any clothes left. So then he went and borrowed from the guy next to him. Right? That's how much of a big deal clothes were. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wants to curb your mind and bring your attention constantly to this one factor. That you're wearing these clothes, but don't forget the one who clothed, who clothed you in it. Oh Allah, all praises and thanks to you for clothing me. Just as you could have put this cloth on me, you can take it away from me at the same time. A person's clothes, and subhanAllah, since we're on this topic, Allah discusses a marital relation, a marriage, in the Qur'an as what? Who knows the ayah? Allah says, you are, you are like a garment for them, they are like a garment for you. What's the purpose of a garment? It covers you. Now, if you will see somebody, mashallah, walking around in a hundred shirt and a lungi, right? You're gonna be like, "What is this guy doing?" Right? He looks weird. Or you see somebody walking around in their pajamas. You can see, look, they look awkward. Why aren't they wearing some proper clothes? A clothes brings dignity to someone. It brings honor to someone. It it protects someone. It guards someone from their faults, from their defects. That's the same purpose of a life of, of a marriage. That what transpires between a husband and a wife. To this point that I advise couples that don't even get your in-laws involved. Every single time, you know, you know what mom, you know what she said to me? Oh dad, you know what he said to me? What this does is it creates animosity. And then what it does is instead of you wearing one shirt of your wife as your, your garment for you, you have the mother-in-law as a garment, and the father as a garment, the father-in-law as a garment, the nani as a garment, the daddy as a garment. So the purpose is, is that it protects you and it, your, your dignity. Anyhow, Rasulullah the next thing he says is that, Ya Allah, Put good in there for me. There's another point of the dua. That I'm not dressing this for, for the wrong intention. You see, you can buy halal clothes, but if you're using it with the bad intention that I'm using it to seduce someone, or I'm using it to get attention from the opposite sex, I'm using it so that I can get attention, then that cloth, cloth already has evil in it. And it already becomes haram. And it loses the barakah. That is why the Prophet would do dua, that, Ya Allah, I'm putting this clothes on there. Don't let it be that, MashaAllah, I put this... 
nice uh, hijab on, and mashallah, I put this nice uh, uh, H&M shirt on, and I put these uh, uh, pants on. Now I'm going outside and everyone's looking at me and saying, Astaghfirullah, sister, mashallah, sister. Right? No, Ya Allah, I do dua that this evil stays away from me. That I don't get engulfed in this evil. Be conscious. You're, you're always mindful of Allah. And this, this is the purpose of du'as. And I think one time you guys should have a class just on du'as. Mm -hmm. What we is do. the purpose of du'as? And you do? Every Monday. Every, Every Monday. Monday. The purpose of du'as is that no matter what you're doing in life, your mind gets curved towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get reminded of Allah over and over again. Mughira bin Sha'ba radiallahu anhu says, I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in a Rumi jubba. Rumi is what? The poet. I was hoping someone said that. <laughs> the Prophet <laughs> didn't wear the poet's jubba. The poet came way afterwards. Rumi is Roman. Right? Rumi is, Jalaluddin Rumi is called Rumi as well as because he was from that area. So Rumi jubba, the Prophet was wearing a Roman cloth. Now, jubba is not what I'm wearing. The Prophet didn't wear thobes like this. The Prophet had, I mean, they weren't, they weren't nicely stitched and everything. No, the Prophet just had a, a cloth that you threw on top. Instead of having his normal shawl, a cloth he threw on top, this was considered a jubba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, if you go to Top Copy, they have all these different uh, clothes and whatnot in Istanbul that they claim that belongs to Prophets and Fatima the and whatnot. Allah knows authenticity behind them. Great museum, though. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I say that because they even try to kick me out. Uh, they said no pictures, and I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I'm like, these are snaps, they're not pictures. They're like, <laughs> they didn't really understand the concept of Snapchat. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wore this Roman jubba, which had narrow sleeves, which shows two things. Number one, the Prophet wasn't biased. He didn't sit there and say that, oh, no, 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 astaghfirullah, the Romans made this. No, 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 I can't wear it. No, no, no. It was made in China, no problem. All right? It's made in USA, no problem. That doesn't have an effect on a person's clothes. You see, there's a difference of opinion. Is there something considered a sunnah attire or not? And there's a very lengthy discussion, but I will sum it up. Ibn Qayyim Jawzi rahimahullah says there is none. However, uh, I would disagree a little bit with Ibn Qayyim on this point, and that is, is that there is, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent him to teach us everything from Walking, talking, eating, drinking, dressing, every single thing. And Allah put the Prophet in such a manner that we can learn from every one of his actions. And the biggest thing about the clothes of the Prophet was that they were modest. They were modest and they were simple. They weren't flashy. The Prophet didn't come out decked out in gold and chains and what do you call uh, uh, robes. No, no, no. The Prophet was simple. To the point that some ahadith come that people from outside would come. Narration is in Sahih Muslim. They would walk inside the masjid and they would say, they would see the Prophet, you know how everyone is sitting like this? Imagine you walk into the masjid and a person walks in and says, Ayyukum Muhammad. <laughs> I hear there's a man who's a messenger. Which one's Muhammad out of you guys? The Sahaba, everyone is sitting down. Nobody can recognize the Prophet, can distinguish him from his followers. And that in itself, if you just think about it, <clears throat> what was the purpose of the Sahaba and the Prophet? They only cared about one thing, Akhirah. How can I get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They didn't care about these transitory things. They didn't focus themselves. It's because they know tomorrow they will have to go towards an interna eternal uh, abode. And I was mentioning my tafsir of Surah Kahf this Tuesday. For those who attended, they would know. I said, when Allah describes Jannah and Jannah, He says something very simple. He says, بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا مِنْ لَدُنْ هُوَ يُبَشِّرَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَزْرًا حَسَنًا مَا Allah says, whatever will happen, whether you get Jannah or Jahannam, ma kithina fihi abada, you'll be there forever. <coughs> he said, forget about what you will get in Jannah, forget about what you will get in Jahannam. Just remember one thing, ma kithina fihi abada. Eternity. And whatever decision you make, you decide it based on the fact that you have to serve eternity. It's not a life sentence, not two life sentences, not three. It's eternity that you have to serve there. So, anyhow, uh, going back uh, to the subject. The clothes of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi There's different levels of clothes. Number one is wajib, fard. This is the highest level. You all have to do this. You all have to wear the clothes that cover your satr. Now, what is a satr? What is a male satr? Can anyone tell me? Navel to navel to the knees, right? There's difference of opinion. According to Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, it begins after the navel, meaning right below the belly button, and it covers the knees. Imam Shafi rahimahullah says it covers the navel, but it doesn't include. The knees. Imam Ali 
his uh, satar is a lot more skimpier than <laughs> everyone else's. Um, so the, the, the fard and the wajib aspect is to cover that, your satar, right? For a woman, what is the satar of a woman? Everything but hands and face. Hands, face, and feet. Right. Hands, face, and feet. Mustahab mandub. What is the mustahab preferred best cl uh, clothing? What is a good clothing? What is uh, something that is recommended? Something that looks nice. Fresh, clean, decent. You don't walk into the masjid and you, you, don't know, you can't tell if, that per if that's the person's kurta or his dastarkhan that he's wearing on top of him, right? Uh, so walk in, look good, look clean. There, you can be humble and still be, look, look nice and look fresh. Um, and just stuff, because people will see me all the times, I do have multiple white dobes. Um, <laughs> I don't have the same one every single time. Just to put that out there, I say this. Whenever I teach classes, I tell them that. Because I was like, what's up, we've seen you with the same clothes every I said, no, no, I actually walk into my wardrobe, I see it. 20 white dogs, and I'm just like, which one should I pick? <laughs> that is a, it's a real story, true story. Makru. What is makru? Makru is, for example, you can afford clothes, but you're wearing tattered and ripped clothes. Let me put it in nowadays terminology. If you're wearing ripped jeans, why? Why do you need to wear jeans that are ripped? Come here, just get, bring normal jeans. I'll take scissors and I'll cut them for you. You don't have to pay extra to get that serviced. Allah has given you a ni'mah. Allah has given you the ability to cover yourself. A lot of these ripped jeans, I mean, again, I'm not here to be politically correct. I'm here to tell you what's in Quran and Sunnah. And again, Quran and Sunnah is Quran and Sunnah. It doesn't change based on how you're going to perceive it or how you want it to be. In this class, one thing I'll tell you by myself is I'm never politically correct. Uh, I tell you whatever is in Quran and Hadith. A lot of people who wear these jeans to, with, uh, with these slits and cuts, their sutra gets revealed especially their thighs. They're praying salah and subhanallah. You know, if you're praying salah, at least wear a long shirt or something, right? Um, so wear a long shirt. Um, so you have the means, be thankful to Allah, and wear proper clothes. Wear something that is decent, right? Haram, what is a haram? What, is, what clothes are considered haram? If men wear silk. Now again, the silk is actual silk, not machine-made silk. <coughs> Machine-made silk is actually not haram to wear. It's because it's not really silk, right? It's fake. It's synthetic. Um, a lot of these ties, clothes, they're made of machine silk. So they're not, they're not real silk. Um, and obviously, if I make synthetic silk, it's not going to have the same ruling as actual silk. This is by consensus of scholars. No talking. The Prophet wasallam liked to wear a qamis. Qamis over here just means a top garment, right? You see, to understand, in, that, in those days, you either wore a shawl, you threw something on top, you walked shirtless, 300 style, or uh, you, uh, you put on a top garment. So the Prophet ﷺ used to like putting on a top garment. The Prophet ﷺ liked modesty. Just because you don't have to cover it, doesn't mean you should start walking around without your, without your shirt on or something. No. Modesty. The Prophet of Allah loved modesty. It was easier and neater than a shawl. Meaning that when you're wearing a shawl, imagine someone in ihrab. They're wearing the top shawl. You can see parts of the you can see parts of their body. It's difficult to maintain. You're on a horse. You're galloping. It's falling down. You're running. You're walking. Sure, you can walk, run, do anything you want, and it stays intact. It covers you. The Prophet's qamis was made of cotton. It was not very long, nor were the sleeves very long. Right? There's different narrations about this. Some say that the sleeves reach up to half of his hand. Some say that they reached up to his wrist. But the Prophet of Allah's sleeves didn't cover his hands. Right? There, it was just enough. It reached up to his wrist. There's people who actually tear, tailor their clothes to make it exactly like the Prophet's clothes. I used to have teachers like that. Um, that used to tailor their clothes exactly the way it's mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah. So they would actually go measure where the sleeves would go up to. Right? That the Prophet didn't want excess clothes. That was the purpose behind it. What's the purpose of not having uh, a, a sleeve that is past the wrist? Because it was unnecessary. The Prophet said, why am I going to have unnecessary cloth that extends beyond it? has no use. You just need to cover up to the hand. Now, if it's past my hand, I'm going to have to pull it back constantly. So this defeats the purpose. If there's any questions, you can raise your hand and ask. One narration, sleeves reached the wrist. Some narration, it reached halfway down the calf. So the Prophet used to... Uh, don't judge me about my socks. Uh, the Prophet wasallam's kurta would go up to here. It would go halfway up to his shin, over here. And again, the whole purpose behind it is 
that, and he just zoomed in on my socks. Uh, the Prophet sallam, the whole purpose behind it was, was that it showed modesty. It showed humility. The Prophet of Allah sallam, was, was the leader of everyone, but he wanted to teach his congregation one thing, is that be humble, uh, lower yourself, don't uh, think you're better than anyone else. The Prophet sallam, only, now how many clothes did the Prophet sallam, owned? How, how many clothes were in the wardrobe of the Prophet? Now, I want everyone to think about their wardrobe. You know when you tell your husband or you tell your parents that I need to get, I need new shoes. Or I need a new purse. Or I must have this dress. You know, and the, this, this, this new jacket is what's trending right now. I have to have it. I want you to reflect on your wardrobe and how much clothes each and every one of us has. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had one lungi. Lungi is that, uh, that, oh, yeah. that little ta towel type of thing. Remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's lungi or his, uh, his um, <coughs> what is it? Izar. No, Izar is different. <coughs> Izar is a, is a pant. Uh, lungi is something that is, it's like a shawl, but you wear it on the, you know you wear a towel? Imagine a towel, but in a cloth form. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have it stitched. Most of the lungis, or most of the things that you, you and I hear of, they're stitched down the middle. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have it stitched. Because to have clothes stitched was a very big deal back in the day. That, oh man, this man had a stitched pair of clothes. Right? It was expensive. The Prophet ﷺ was one-sided. Now, the interesting thing behind this is that if it's one-sided, right, and if it's, if it's not stitched, it's very difficult to ride a horse and walk and it stays on and whatnot. I don't have a scarf on me, but inshallah, uh, some of the other classes remind me, I'll bring, a, I'll bring a shawl with me, and hopefully I still remember how to do it. Uh, one of our teachers showed us that uh, how to tie uh, uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu type of lungi, right? With, uh, and how to tie it, and it was really impressive, it was because he was like, pull. And I was like, I don't know. And he was like, <laughs> no, no, he had another one on top, right? <laughs> he was like, uh, pull. And he went to me out of everybody, and I was like, ah. Like, He's like, no, 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 I want you to pull it. I was like, so and I'm, I I was literally hanging on to it and it was it was it was fastened pretty neatly like it wasn't coming out right and he was like this because he was straight from the village so he understood the concept and he was like this is how we would ride our horses our donkeys and whatever and whatnot and I was like as long as you don't drive your cars like this uh, you're good <laughs> Muawiyah bin Qurra radiallahu anhu said and this is a very beautiful hadith he said I came to visit the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and I saw his top button open. I reached in and I went to touch his seal. Now, Muawiyah bin Qura radiallahu anhu, after seeing the Prophet sallallahu with his shirt open, some narrations say it was only one button, some say that he had multiple buttons open. The Prophet was just sitting, it was hot, and he was just sitting with it open. So Muawiyah bin Qura says, I saw the Prophet like this. He said, after that day, I never buttoned my shirts. He said, I, he was a big governor later on. He, uh, not a governor, but he was, a, he was a, this wasn't the same as Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. But uh, he, was, he was a prominent individual. And he would walk around with his shirt open. Not because he's trying to show off his pecs or something. But he's there just because I saw the Nabi like this. That memory was etched in my mind. And I just want to be like how I saw him. You might have seen him differently. I, I respect how you all saw him. But the memory of me and this beautiful man was just of him like this, and I am going to keep that on myself, uh, and I'm going to, what do you call that, uh, keep it open. The Prophet Sallallahu wore white and preferred it. Hence, I'm wearing white. Uh, one time I was walking in New Jersey at nighttime uh, in front of my house, and one guy stops and pulls the window down, and he was like, holy. He said, I thought that was a ghost. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wore a turban. The Prophet ﷺ used to have different types of turbans. He had, uh, and we'll go into discussion later on, about the turbans of the Prophet ﷺ. But this is a forgotten sunnah. Uh, most of us don't wear turbans. The Prophet ﷺ used to have <coughs> different types of turbans. And he used, to call, he used to call this the crown of the ummah. The Prophet of Allah also wore green sheets and red sheets before too. He would wear green and red as well. Anas ﷺ who says that I saw Rasulullah ﷺ came out of his house with the assistance of Usama bin Zayd. This is towards the end of the Prophet Sallallahu life, where he was weak. So he's coming on with Usama bin Zayd, and Anas al who's painting this picture. He says, I see the Prophet coming out of his house with Usama bin Zayd. At that time, he was wrapped in a Yemeni printed sheet, and he came and he led the Salah Sahaba in prayer. 
this hadith is very interesting, is because um, Yahya ibn Ma'in narrates this hadith. He says, I heard this from, I can't remember the person's his name. He says, I heard this hadith from him. So when I heard it from him, I forget the narrator's name. He said, when I heard the hadith from him, I said, min kitabik. He said, I respect the fact that you're telling me the hadith, but I would prefer if you go bring the recorded version of the hadith and read it from your book to me. So he says, so Yahya ibn Rain says that, so this man got up to go, I grabbed his clothes, and I pulled him, and I said, no, 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 no. Never mind. Say the hadith to me. He said, because I am scared that by the time you leave from here and you go in your room to get the book and you come back, I might die. So read, read the hadith to me from your memory and then go bring the book back. It's because maybe I might die in the next two minutes. This was how much focus and how important their time was. Today, party starts at 7.30, guaranteed everyone's coming at 9.30. And I, when I perform nikah, Dr. Ursula knows. I'm very specific on my time. Ask him. I walked out of the, I told them, 1.30. They weren't there, I left. This is, yeah. The, and the guy came, he said, Mufti Sahab, nikah, this and that. I said, Jazakallah khair. He said, oh, we're from the same area back at home. I said, we could be from anywhere. I said, doesn't matter, I'm not performing the nikah. And then Dr. Ursula is a good friend of mine. So I said, because of him, I'll come back. Uh, someone came last night to me as well to perform a nikah. And I said, I only have one condition. Whatever time you give me, Past 15 minutes, I'm not going to stay there. So I said, time is important. A, a mu'min's word is important. This is ridiculous. We go to events, parties, and we're just there wasting time. Time has no importance in our life. You just sit there and, subhanAllah, I remember when we were a kid. I don't know if I should be recording this or not, but when we were a kid, I remember one time, my mom was like, we get to a party, we get there on time. My mom was like, we have to stay in the parking lot a little bit. We can't, we can't arrive there on time. Right? And it was like a taboo thing that, oh, don't go on time. Go a little late. Because they're going to be like, oh, wow, they came actually on time. Who comes on time, right? Um, so this is uh, against the prophetic uh, sunnah. Be on time, please. The blessed socks of the Prophet So we went from his... Yes? I don't know if this is relevant now, but you said he wore a turban. So how did the concept of dopey, dopey come into play? No? How did the concept of dopey come into play? Because the Prophet said that the difference between our turban and the mushrikeen's turban was the, was the hat. Right? So the Prophet would wear the hat. There's other narrations where the Prophet ﷺ wore a hat. There's other narration the Prophet ﷺ said, if you are praying salah and you have nothing else to block you in front of your sutra, put your hat there. That means that in order for you to put your hat there, you'd have to be wearing a hat. Hmm. The concept of hat was so normal back in the day that you didn't really need to mention it. It was just understood that people would wear it. When the Prophet ﷺ put on a cloth, remember I mentioned last week that the Prophet ﷺ used to oil his hair. And then what did I mention? What did he do after that? Put, put, like a a cloth. put a cloth. Why put a cloth on top of your head? head you only do it if you're putting another thing on top of it. You won't put a cloth on your head if you're not putting something on top of it. If you're just walking around with your hair all gelled up, that's cool, right? But the Prophet wore something on top of it, therefore he put the cloth so that thing didn't get discolored from there. And uh, when we're next week, inshallah, we'll discuss the turban of the Prophet In there, I'll bring evidences uh, on the hat and what the point is about that, yes. From last week, does anyone remember what hadith we just we, we uh, discussed last week? The one by the one by Ali Ali describing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What are some of the things we discussed about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We started off with the general description. Yeah. After that, what did we discuss about the Prophet? What attribute of his hair? His hair. What did we say about his hair? The what is the earlobe's hair called? Juma. Juma? Anyone else? Earlobes. Hair to the earlobes. What is it called? I should have bought those Daisy brownies. <laughs> Wafra. From earlobe to the shoulders in between. What is it called? Jumma's tomorrow. Limma. <laughs> Limma. Right. Limma. And to the shoulders? Jumma. Jumma. What else did we say about the hair about the Prophet? What color, how many white strands of hair did the Prophet have? 18. 14, 14 and 20. 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 17, 18, 20. Right? Where was the white hair located? Beard and? Beard and? 
and Temple. Temple. I had the opportunity to go many places where people said that they had the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu From Top Copy Museum in Istanbul to people's homes. There was one man though. His claim for the Prophet's hair was the strongest that I had seen. And there's a reason. It was because besides the fact that he had a chain for it, besides that fact, besides the fact that he was one of the top scholars of South Africa, besides that, besides the fact that he swore to Allah and said that for 30 years I never put a drop of itar on there, and when he opened, my own eyes I see this, when he opened the he wouldn't show it to everybody, uh, but because that scholar was very good friends with my father, he opened the top, and his grandson was actually my classmate. He opened the top, he said, Wallahi, for 30 years I never put a drop of itar on there, or perfume. But when he opened the top, the room fi filled with fragrance. He had mentioned that that hair he got from someone from England who the hair of the Prophet some grows. Right? It continues to grow. And he says that from the root, another strand was growing. So that person broke off from the root and gave it to him. But that's, that's beside the point. I'm not judging the man by his words. I remember in 2011, I believe it was, I went to Medina Munawwara. His name was Sheikh Yunus Patel, rahimahullah. I met him in Medina Munawwara. We had a majlis. After that, every single day, he would have a class. After Medina, he went to Mecca. I had to fly back to South Africa to give my exams for my Mufti course. And then I flew back to Mecca. So I went home for about, I went to South Africa for about a week. And then I came back. When I came back, obviously, while I was in South Africa for that week, he went from Medina to Mecca. Throughout this man's life, he had one dua. That, Ya Allah, I want to die in Medina the Munawwara. He had many chances of getting iqama or a green card for Saudi Arabia, but it always required lying. It always required fake papers, fake something. So he, but it was through connections. So he said, I won't go to the Prophet's city by lying. If I go, I go honestly. So he would constantly get the visa, the whole procedure and whatnot. So the last, well, he, was in, he went from Medina to Mecca. His last speech he gave in Medina Munawwara, he began like this. He said, people say, it's online as well. He said, people say all good things come to an end. I say all good things and bad things, everything must come to an end. And then he began his speech, that was his final speech. He went, he went to Makkah Mukarramah, he did Umrah. After he did Umrah, he stood on top of the mountain of Marwa, and he did Dua. He said, Ya Allah, if Medina is not destined for me, make Makkah destined for me. <laughs> the next day, he did Tawaf, before Maghrib Salah. He went around the Kaaba seven times. He prayed, he, the Adhan happened, then he prayed the Jamaat. After that, he went inside the Haram, and then he came back down. As he came back down, he stood in front of the Hatim, the area where, the, where the, there's a wall. He stood there and he began doing dua. He did dua before Maghrib Salah, prayed Maghrib Salah, went into the building, came back out, stood by the Hatim, did dua, and that is how Allah took his soul. In front of the Kaaba doing dua. At that time, they were not allowing anyone to get buried in Jannatul Mu'allah, any outsider. You have to be a Saudi. But because of his high position as a scholar, South African diplomats, you know, have you heard of Hashim Amla? The cricketer? Mm -hmm. The person who put Hashim Amla on track is this man. Sheikh Yunus Patel Rahimullah. I remember actually going inside his office in Durban and Hashim Amla was walking out. And then someone was like, you know who that is? And I was like, who? They're like, that's Hashim Amla. And I was like, what sport does he play? They're like, cricket. I was like, yeah, okay, we don't care about cricket. We're <laughs> Americans. <laughs> so I judged the man by the way he passed away. That's how I judge the man's words. Uh, and now that hair was passed down to his grandson, not my classmate, my classmate's younger brother. Anyway, I just want to remark that story on the hair of Rasulullah The next chapter is about the blessed antimony of Rasulullah This is antimony, not alimony. This is antimony in English, uh, or in uh, Urdu or Arabic. It's, in Arabic it's called kubr, and in Urdu it's called surma. And in English, it's called antimony. Um, just to make it very clear, this is not eyeliner. So if you go home today and start grabbing your wife's eyeliner and says that I need this, I need this MAC makeup for my eyes because I have to fulfill the sunnah, you'll be doing the opposite where Allah says don't be like, um, don't dress like women, right? You'll be doing the opposite then. Rasulullah, Ibn Abbas who says, Rasulullah has said, the best from amongst all the kuhl, the best antimony, the best surma, the best from amongst all the kuhl used by you is the one made from ithmid. Ithmid is a certain type of Qur'an. It brightens the eyesight 
it strengthens the growth of the eyelashes. It <coughs> adds a volume to your eyelash and it extends and it makes your eyes stronger as well. Rasulullah used to apply kuhl every single night. Men apply it at night. Women can obviously, because they're, they're, they'll be at home or uh, surma on eyeliners and for them it's different. But for men, they should not put it on in the morning and go, otherwise they will look like Kung Fu Panda when uh, they, they go to work. So they should apply it at nighttime before they go to sleep. The effect happens and then they wake up in the morning. Now, what is the sunnah? Abu Dawud narrates that Rasulullah used to put ithmid in his eyes an odd number of times. So the scholars have numerous opinions. And because I want to move on with the sabah, uh, with the class lessons, I don't want to go into details in any certain point. There are different opinions. One says that Rasulullah used to put it three times in his right eye, then three times in his left eye. In another opinion, the Prophet did one, 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 one. So three times. Do the right one, then the left one. The right one, the left one. Third opinion is the Prophet ﷺ did one, twice, thrice. Right? So two times in the right eye, third, uh, one time in the left eye. And just like this, there are many opinions about it. You can do any of them. Nabi Sallallahu said do it an odd number of times. It strengthens the vision. It makes the eyelash close. The Prophet ﷺ stressed the usage of ithmid. The Prophet ﷺ is a peril, or as... The class was called before they changed the name, the swag of the prophet. <laughs> then prophetic they were, swag. Huh? Prophetic swag. The prophetic swag. And then they thought that I would be banned and everyone else who came up with the name would be banned. We changed the name. <laughs> Abu Sa'id Khudr ta'ala anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu put on a new garment. He would in happiness mention the garment's name. For example, Allah ta'ala gave me this qameez. Allah gave me this shawl. Allah gave me this hoodie. Allah gave me these... Jordans. Then he would recite the dua. Allahumma laka alhamdu kama kasawtanihi. As'aluka khayrahu wa khayra ma suni alahu. Wa a'udhu bika min sharri wa sharri ma suni alahu. O oh Allah, all praise and thanks are for you. For clothing me with this garment, I ask you for the good of it and the good of what it was made for. And I ask you your protection from the evil of it and the evil of what it was made for. There's a reason why the Prophet did this dua. Whenever you guys go shopping, Galleria, go to the mall, Black Friday sales, find some nice hoodies or some clothes, the first thing a person does is when they wear it, they feel proud. They have this sense of pride fills in your heart that, I'm not looking pretty fresh. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking good, right? You're looking at yourself, selfie time, selfie time, half a eye selfie, quarter eye selfie, right? One hair selfie, right? Behind the eye selfie. <laughs> Um, so anyhow, so everyone starts, they, they, you admire yourself, you put on all these filters on Instagram, put yourself, you know, and then you hashtag no filter, <laughs> after that, uh, look for the best lighting. It brings a sense of pride. You see, Islam has one fundamental principle in it. And this is where I would say we clash to a certain degree with the West. And this principle, which is Islam stresses humility. I think that brother wants a seat. Give him some Islam stresses on humility. On a person thinking, you see, there's a difference between having high self-esteem and being and being prideful. High self-esteem means that you are content with where you are. You're content. In high self-esteem, you have you're, you're content. But in pride, you think you are better than the person next to you. That look, I'm rocking a Chanel bag. I'm rocking a Louis Vuitton pair of shoes. Look at that guy, he's wearing Payless. And the, he's, he got the, that's the second pair half off one too. Not even the original Payless. He got the second one on discount, right? And you automatically start feeling that I, I feel better about myself. There was one of my teachers, teacher Mufti Wali Hassan. This man was so conscious about himself that one time he was walking and he wore a nice white cloth, nice jubba, nice shirt, and he walked outside. And he felt in himself that I'm feeling better about myself than other people. I'm having pride. So right away, he made some marks on his clothes to take away the beauty. Someone said, what are you doing? You just destroyed the whole pair of cloth. He said, no, this cloth was detrimental to me. It was because it made me feel better than the person next to me. So Rasulullah 
would constantly just went into the closet. <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I get distracted very quickly, so we're gonna have to hurry up with this with this chair. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would bring your mind, first of all, back in the day, clothes were a big deal. You know how nowadays uh, cars are a big deal. Nowadays, you have uh, clothes don't mean anything. You can go to Walmart, you can go to Children's Wear, you can go to uh, what are the other bootlegging clothes places here? Fubu. TJ Maxx. Fubu still exists. Oh, yeah. TJ Maxx, Marshalls, you can go anywhere. But in the time of Rasulullah said them, clothes were a big deal it was because they weren't just manufactured, mass produced. They were people made them <clears throat> with their hands. They were expensive. Having a cloth, you gave someone a cloth uh, for their for, for their uh, as a wedding gift. You gave it as it was a big deal. To the point that there was this one Sahabi named Kaab bin Malik radiAllahu Very long story, very long incident. But when he was given the glad tidings of him being forgiven by Allah, the first thing he did was he gave his clothes. And then he was like, man, I don't even have any clothes left. So then he went and borrowed from the guy next to him. Right? That's how much of a big deal clothes were. So Rasulullah sallallahu wants to curb your mind and bring your attention constantly to this one factor. That you're wearing these clothes, but don't forget the one who clothed, who clothed you in it. Oh Allah, all praises and thanks to you for clothing me. Just as you could have put this cloth on me, you can take it away from me at the same time. A person's clothes, and subhanAllah, since we're on this topic, Allah discusses a marital relation a marriage in the Quran as what? Who knows the ayah? Allah says, "You are you are like a garment for them. They are like a garment for you. What's the purpose of a garment? It covers you. Now, if you will see somebody, mashallah, walking around in a hundred shirt and a lungi, right? You're gonna be like, what is this guy doing? Right? He looks weird. Or you see somebody walking around in their pajamas, you can see, look, they look awkward. Why aren't they wearing some proper clothes? A clothes brings dignity to someone. It brings honor to someone. It, it protects someone. It guards someone from their faults, from their defects. That's the same purpose of a, life, of, of a marriage. That what transpires between a husband and a wife, to this point that I advise couples that don't even get your in-laws involved. Every single time, you know, you know what mom, you know what she said to me? Oh, dad, you know what he said to me? What this does is it creates animosity. And then what it does is instead of you wearing one shirt of your wife as your, your garment for you, you have the mother-in-law as a garment, and the father as a garment, the father-in-law as a garment, the nani as a garment, the dadi as a garment. So the purpose is, is that it protects you and it, your, your dignity. Anyhow, Rasulullah the next thing he says is that, Ya Allah, put good in there for me. There's another point of the dua, that I'm not dressing this for, for the wrong intention. You see, you can buy halal clothes, but if you're using it with the bad intention that I'm using it to seduce someone, or I'm using it to get attention from the opposite sex, I'm using it so that I can get attention, then that cloth, cloth already has evil in it. And it already becomes haram. And it loses the barakah. That is why the Prophet would do dua that, Ya Allah, I'm putting this clothes on there. Don't let it be that, MashaAllah, I put this nice uh, hijab on, and MashaAllah, I put this nice uh, uh, H&M shirt on, and I put these uh, uh, pants on. Now I'm going outside and everyone's looking at me and saying, Astaghfirullah, sister, mashallah, sister. Right? No, Ya Allah, I do dua that this evil stays away from me. That I don't get engulfed in this evil. Be conscious. You, you're always mindful of Allah. And this, this is the purpose of du'as. And I think one time you guys should have a class just on du'as. Mm -hmm. What we is do. the purpose of du'as? And you do? Every Monday. Every, Every Monday. Monday. The purpose of du'as is that no matter what you're doing in life, your mind gets curved towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get reminded of Allah over and over again. Mughira bin Sharba radiallahu anhu says, I saw Rasulullah in a Rumi jubba. Rumi is what? The poet. I was hoping someone said that. <laughs> the Prophet <laughs> didn't wear the poet's jubba. The poet came way afterwards. Rumi is Roman. Right? Rumi is, Jalaluddin Rumi is called Rumi as well as because he was from that area. So Rumi jubba, the Prophet was wearing a Roman cloth. Now, jubba is not what I'm wearing. The Prophet didn't wear thobes like this. The Prophet had, I mean, they weren't, they weren't nicely stitched and everything. No, the Prophet just had a, a cloth that you threw on top. Instead of having his normal shawl, a cloth he threw on top, this was considered a jubba of the Prophet ﷺ. And again, if you go to Top Copy, they have all these different uh, clothes and whatnot in Istanbul that they claim that 
belongs to prophets and Fatima and Allah and whatnot. Allah knows the authenticity behind them. Great museum though. Uh, Rasulullah <laughs> uh, I say that because they even try to kick me out. Uh, they said no pictures and I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I was like, these are snaps and not pictures. Like, they didn't really understand the concept of Snapchat. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wore this Roman jubak which had narrow sleeves, which shows two things. Number one, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wasn't biased. He didn't sit there and say that, oh, no, 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 astaghfirullah, the Romans made this. No, 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 I can't wear it. No, no, no. Was it made in China? No problem. All right? It's made in USA? No problem. That doesn't have an effect on a person's clothes. You see, there's a difference of opinion. Is there something considered a sunnah attire or not? And there's a very lengthy discussion, but I will sum it up. Ibn Qayyim Jawzi rahimahullah says there is none. However, uh, I would disagree a little bit with Ibn Qayyim on this point, and that is, is that there is, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet وسلم, He sent him to teach us everything. From walking, talking, eating, drinking, dressing, every single thing. And Allah put the Prophet in such a manner that we can learn from every one of his actions. And the biggest thing about the clothes of the Prophet وسلم, was that they were modest. They were modest and they were simple. They weren't flashy. The Prophet وسلم, didn't come out decked out in gold and chains and what do you call... Uh, uh, robes. No, no, no. The Prophet was simple. Mm -hmm. To the point that some ahadith come that people from outside would come. Narration is in Sahih Muslim. They would walk inside the masjid and they would say, they would see the Prophet, you know how everyone is sitting like this? Imagine you walk into the masjid and a person walks in and says, Ayyukum Muhammad. <laughs> I hear there's a man who's a messenger. Which one's Muhammad out of you guys? The Sahaba, everyone is sitting down. Nobody can recognize the Prophet can distinguish him from his followers. And that in itself, if you just think about it, <coughs> what was the purpose of the Sahaba and the Prophet They only cared about one thing, Akhara. How can I get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They didn't care about these transitory things. They didn't focus themselves. It's because they know tomorrow they will have to go towards an internal, eternal uh, abode. And I was mentioning my tafsir of Surah Kahf this Tuesday. For those who attended, they would know. I said, when Allah describes Jannah and Jannah, He says something very simple. He says, Allah says, whatever will happen, whether you get Jannah or Jahannam, you'll be the forever. He said, forget about what you will get in Jannah, forget about what you will get in Jahannam. Just remember one thing. Eternity. And whatever decision you make, you decide it based on the fact that you have to serve eternity. It's not a life sentence, not two life sentences, not three. It's eternity that you have to serve there. So, anyhow, uh, going back uh, to the subject. The clothes of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi there's different levels of clothes. Number one is wajib, fard. This is the highest level. You all have to do this. You all have to wear the clothes that cover your satr. Now, what is a satr? What is a male satr? Can anyone tell me? Navel to, navel to the knees, right? There's difference of opinion. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, it begins after the navel, meaning right below the belly button, and it covers the knees. Imam Shafi rahimahullah, says it covers the navel, but it doesn't include the knees. Imam Ali rahimahullah, his uh, satr is a lot more skimpier than everyone else's. Um, so the, the, the fard and the wajib aspect is to cover that, your satr, right? For a woman, what is the satr of a woman? Everything but hands and face. Hands, face, and feet. Hands, face, and feet. Mustahab mandu. What is the mustahab preferred best clothing? What is a good clothing? What is uh, something that is recommended? Something that looks nice, fresh, clean, decent. You don't walk into the masjid and you, you don't you can't tell if that per if that's the person's kurta or his dastarkhan that he's wearing on top of him, right? Uh, so walk in, look good, look clean. There, you can be humble and still be look look nice and look fresh. Um, and just uh, because people will see me all the times, I do have multiple white dopes. Um, <laughs> I don't have the same one every single time. Just to put that out there. I say this. Whenever I teach classes, I tell them that. Because I was like, what's up? We've seen you with the same clothes. Every I said, no, 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 I actually walk into my wardrobe, I see a 20 white dopes, and I'm just like, which one should I pick? <laughs> that is a, it's a real story, true story. Makru. What is makru? Makru is, for example, you can afford clothes, but you're wearing tattered and ripped clothes. Let me put it in nowadays terminology. If you're wearing ripped jeans, why? Why do you need to wear jeans that are ripped? Come here, just get, bring normal jeans. 
I'll take scissors and I'll cut them for you. You don't have to pay extra to get that service. Allah has given you a ni'mah. Allah has given you the ability to cover yourself. A lot of these ripped jeans, I mean, again, I'm not here to be politically correct. I'm here to tell you what's in the Quran and Sunnah. And again, Quran and Sunnah is Quran and Sunnah. It doesn't change based on how you're going to perceive it or how you want it to be. In this class, one thing I'll tell you by myself is I'm never politically correct. Uh, I tell you whatever is in Quran and Hadith. A lot of people who wear these jeans to, with, the, with these slits and cuts, their stuff there gets revealed, especially their thighs. They're praying Salah and SubhanAllah. You know, if you're praying Salah, at least wear a long shirt or something, right? Um, so wear a long shirt. Um, so you have the means, be thankful to Allah, and wear proper clothes. Wear something that is decent, right? Haram, what is a haram? What, is, what clothes are considered haram? If men wear silk, now again, the silk is actual silk, not machine-made silk. <coughs> machine-made silk is actually not haram to wear. It's because it's not really silk, right? It's fake. It's synthetic. Um, a lot of these ties, clothes, they're made of machine silk. So they're not, they're not real silk. Um, and obviously, if I make synthetic silk, it's not going to have the same ruling as actual silk. This is by consensus of scholars. Don't talk. The Prophet wasallam liked to wear a qamis. Qamis over here just means a top garment, right? You see, to understand, in, that, in those days, you either wore a shawl, you threw something on top, you walked shirtless, 300 style, or uh, you, uh, you put on a top garment. So the Prophet used to like putting on a top garment. The Prophet liked modesty. Just because you don't have to cover it, doesn't mean you should start walking around without your, without your shirt on or something. No. Modesty. The Prophet of Allah loved modesty. It was easier and neater than a shawl. Meaning that when you're wearing a shawl, imagine someone in ihrah. They're wearing the top shawl. You can see parts of the you can see parts of their body. It's difficult to maintain. You're on a horse. You're galloping. It's falling down. You're running. You're walking. Sure, you can walk, run, do anything you want, and it stays intact. It covers you. The Prophet qamis was made of cotton. It was not very long, nor were the sleeves very long. Right? There's different narrations about this. Some say that the sleeves reach up to half of his hand. Some say that they reached up to his wrist. But the Prophet of Allah's sleeves didn't cover his hands, right? They're, it was just enough. It reached up to his wrist. There's people who actually tailor, tailor their clothes to make it exactly like the Prophet's clothes. I used to have teachers like that. Um, that used to tailor their clothes exactly the way it's mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah So they would actually go measure where the sleeves would go up to, right? That the Prophet didn't want excess clothes. That was the purpose behind it. What's the purpose of not having uh, uh, a sleeve that is past the wrist because it was unnecessary. The Prophet said, why am I going to have unnecessary cloth that extends beyond it? It has no use. You just need to cover up to the hand. Now if it's past my hand, I'm going to have to pull it back constantly. So this defeats the purpose. If there's any questions, you can raise your hand and ask. One narration, sleeves reach the wrist. Some narration, it reached halfway down the calf. So the Prophet said, Allah said, used to... Uh, don't judge me by my socks. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's kurta would go up to here. It would go halfway up to his shin, over here. And again, the whole purpose behind it is that, and you just zoomed in on my socks. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's the whole purpose behind it was was that it showed modesty, it showed humility. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was was the leader of everyone, but he wanted to teach his congregation one thing: is that be humble, uh, lower yourself. Don't uh, think you're better than anyone else. The Prophet Sallallahu only, now how many clothes did the Prophet Sallallahu owned? How, how many clothes were in the wardrobe of the Prophet? Now, I want everyone to think about their wardrobe. You know when you tell your husband or you tell your parents that I need to get, I need new shoes. Or I need a new purse. Or I must have this dress. You know, and the, this, this, this new jacket is what's trending right now. I have to have it. I want you to reflect on your wardrobe and how much clothes each and every one of us has. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had one lungi. Lungi is that, uh, the, that little ta towel type of thing. Remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's lungi or his, uh, his um, what is it? Izar. No, Izar is different. Izar is a, is a pant. Uh, lungi is something that is, it's like a shawl, but you wear it on the, now you wear a towel. Imagine a towel, but in a cloth form. The Prophet ﷺ did not have it stitched. 
most of the lungis or most of the things that you, you and I hear of, they're stitched down the middle. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have it stitched. Because to have clothes stitched was a very big deal back in the day. That, oh man, this man had a stitched pair of clothes. Right? It was expensive. The Prophet ﷺ was one-sided. Now, the interesting thing behind this is that if it's one-sided, right, and if it's, if it's not stitched, it's very difficult to ride a horse and walk and it stays on and whatnot. I don't have a scarf on me, but inshallah, uh, some of the other classes remind me, I'll bring, a, I'll bring a shawl with me, and hopefully I still remember how to do it. Uh, one of our teachers showed us that uh, how to tie uh, uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu type of lungi, right? With, uh, and how to tie it, and it was really impressive. It was because he was like, pull. And I was like, I don't know. And he was like, no, no, he had another one on top, right? He was like, uh, pull. And he went to me out of everybody, and I was like, ah. Uh, they're like, he's like, no, 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 I want you to pull it. I was like, all right, man. So, and I'm, I, I was literally hanging on to it. And it was, it was, it was fastened pretty neatly. Like, it wasn't coming out. Right? And he was like, this, because he was straight from the village. So he understood the concept. And he was like, this is how we would ride our horses, our donkeys, and whatever, and whatnot. And I was like, as long as you don't drive your cars like this, uh, <laughs> you're good. Muawiyah bin Qura radiallahu anhu said, and this is a very beautiful hadith. He said, I came to visit the Prophet وسلم, and I saw his top button open. I reached in and I went to touch his seal. Now, Muawiyah bin Qura radiallahu anhu, after seeing the Prophet وسلم, with his shirt open, some narrations say it was only one button, some say that he had multiple buttons open. The Prophet was just sitting, it was hot, and he was just sitting with it open. So Muawiyah bin Qura says, I saw the Prophet like this. He said, after that day, I never buy my shirts. He said, I, he was a big governor later on. He, uh, not a governor, but he was, a, he was a, this wasn't the same as Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, but uh, he, was, he was a prominent individual. And he would walk around with his shirt open, not because he's trying to show off his pecs or something, but he's there just because I saw the Nabi like this, that memory was etched in my mind, and I just want to be like how I saw him. You might have seen him differently, and I respect how you all saw him. But the memory of me and this beautiful man was just of him like this, and I am gonna keep that on myself, uh, and I'm gonna, what do you call that, keep it open. The Prophet Sallallahu wore white and preferred it. Hence, I'm wearing white. Uh, one time I was walking in New Jersey at nighttime uh, in front of my house, and one guy stops and pulls the window down, and he was like, holy. He said, I thought it was a ghost. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu wore a turban. The Prophet Sallallahu used to have different types of turbans. He had, uh, and we'll go into discussion later on, about the turbans of the Prophet Sallallahu But this is a forgotten sunnah. Uh, most of us don't wear turbans. The Prophet Sallallahu used to have different types of turbans. And he used to call, he used to call this the crown of the ummah. The Prophet of Allah also wore green sheets and red sheets before too. He would wear green and red as well. Anas radiallahu anhu says that I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came out of his house with the assistance of Usama bin Zayd. This is towards the end of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life where he was weak. So he's coming on with Usama bin Zayd and Anas radiallahu anhu is painting this picture. He says, I see the Prophet coming out of his house with Usama bin Zayd. At that time he was wrapped in a Yemeni printed sheet and he came and he led the salah, Sahaba in prayer. This hadith is very interesting. It's because um, Yahya ibn Ma'in narrates this hadith. He says, I heard this from, I can't remember his name. He says, I heard this hadith from him. So when I heard it from him, I forget the narrator's name. He said, when I heard the hadith from him, I said, min kitabik. He said, I respect the fact that you're telling me the hadith, but I would prefer if you go bring the recorded version of the hadith and read it from your book to me. So he says, so, Yahya Narain says that so this man got up to go, I grabbed his clothes and I pulled him and I said, No, 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 no. Never mind. Say the hadith to me. He said, Because I am scared that by the time you leave from here and you go in your room to get the book and you come back, I might die. So read, read the hadith to me from your memory and then go bring the book back is because maybe I might die in the next two minutes. This was how much focus and how important their time was. Today, party starts at 7.30, guaranteed everyone's coming at 9.30. And I, when I perform nikah, Dr. Ursula knows, I'm very specific on my time. Ask him. I walked out of the, I told them 1.30. They weren't there, I left. 
This is, you know. The, and the guy came, he said, Mufti Sahab, Nikah, this and that. I said, Jazakallah khair. He said, oh, we're from the same area back at home. I said, we could be from anywhere. <laughs> I said, doesn't matter, I'm not performing the nikah. And then Dr. Arsalan yeah. is a good friend of mine. So I said, because of him, I'll come back. Uh, someone came last night to me as well to perform a nikah. And I said, I only have one condition. Whatever time you give me, past 15 minutes, I'm not going to stay there. I said, I have, time is important. A, a mu'min's word is important. This is ridiculous. We go to events, parties, and we're just there wasting time. Time has no importance in our life. You just sit there and, subhanAllah, I remember when we were a kid, I don't know if I should be recording this or not, but when we were a kid, I remember one time, my mom was like, we get to a party, we get there on time. My mom's like, we have to stay in the parking lot a little bit. We can't, we can't arrive there on time, right? And it was like a taboo thing that, oh, don't go on time, go a little late. Because they're going to be like, oh, wow, they came actually on time. Who comes on time, right? Um, so this is uh, against the prophetic uh, sunnah. Be on time, please. The blessed socks of the Prophet So we went from his... Yes. I don't know if this is relevant now, but you said you wore a turban. So how did the concept of dopey, dopey come into play? No. How did the concept of dopey come into play? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that the difference between our turban and the Mushrikeen's turban was the, was the hat. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ would wear the hat. There's other narrations where the Prophet ﷺ wore a hat. There's other narrations where the Prophet ﷺ said, if you are praying Salah and you have nothing else to block you in front of your sutra, put your hat there. That means that in order for you to put your hat there, you have to be wearing a hat. The concept of hat was so normal back in the day that you didn't really need to mention it. It was just understood that people would wear it. When the Prophet ﷺ put on a cloth, remember I mentioned last week that the Prophet ﷺ used to oil his hair. And then what did I mention? What did he do after that? Put a cloth. Why put a cloth on top of your head? You only do it if you're putting another thing on top of it. You won't put a cloth on your head if you're not putting something on top of it. If you're just walking around with your hair all gelled up, that's cool, right? But the Prophet wore something on top of it, therefore he put the cloth so that thing didn't get discolored from there. And uh, when we're next week, inshallah, we'll discuss the turban of the Prophet In there, I'll bring evidences uh, on the hat and what the point is about that. Yes. So the Hanafis give a reply to that and they say, well, he was giving it to his wife, not for himself. Uh, so again, if we go into the discussion of fiqh and whatnot, it will get very detailed and very long uh, and going through the different arguments and whatnot. The Prophet ﷺ started wearing it from the 6th or the 7th year of Hijrah. There is one hadith, some scholars say the Prophet only had one ring, but the correct opinion is, is that he had multiple rings. Uh, he liked this stone called Aqiq from Yemen. Is Aqiq Yemeni? Something similar to this, right? It's called Aqiq Yemeni. Again, I don't know if this, is, if this was... I heard that from so this is a certain type of uh, gem, uh, from, from Yemen. The Prophet ﷺ praised it. It was also mentioned that he wore it, Aqiq from Yemen. Uh, I used to have a ring that I used to wear, Aqiq uh, Yemani. Uh, and then they, someone was like, oh, can I wear your ring? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then they broke the ring. Um, the Prophet ﷺ had another ring that had a gem from Habasha. So some scholars say, that it was actually an Abyssinian man that made it. Some scholars say that it was bought in Habasha. They try to bring different opinions, but the correct opinion is, is that the Prophet had multiple rings and he would wear a different one of them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wore it sometimes on his right hand, sometimes on his left hand. He wore it on his pinky, okay? Ali radiallahu anhu, the narration is in Sahih Muslim. He said the Prophet forbade to wear it on your middle finger. And he forbade it to wear it on your ring finger. Again, this could be discouraged. It's, it's, it's not on the level of haram, but the Prophet ﷺ definitely did discourage to wear your ring. The Prophet ﷺ basically did not encourage people to wear rings and flash, be flashy. Right? You wear it on your pinky, it's generally a small ring. Right? You wear it on any other finger, it's big, it, it holds beauty. You wear it on your pink, it doesn't really hold beauty to it. Right? Unless you're really thugged out or something. But uh, uh, usually it's the middle rings, the middle fingers are these other fingers that denote the beauty of the ring. Women can wear a ring in all fingers. Uh, as many rings as they want, uh, so whoever is married here, go to Zales afterwards uh, and take it. The Prophet ﷺ used to keep the ring hidden, and when he used it, the ones that had Muhammad Rasulullah inscribed on it, he would put it on, at times he wouldn't wear it, sometimes he would wear it. The sword of the Prophet ﷺ. Anas radiallahu who reports that the handle of the sword of the Prophet was made of silver. Okay? The Prophet had many swords. 
he had one called Mathur, inherited from his father, Qadib, Qil'i, Tabar, Dhul Fiqar, that he gave to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He had multiple swords and the discussion in the next ones. These are some of the pictures of some of the swords. Uh, Wallahu a'lam how true they are. I wasn't there when the Prophet was using the sword. Uh, <laughs> al Mikhdam, this is one sword. al Qadib, this is another sword. al Adab, this is another sword. al Mathur, this is the one that he got from his father. Dhul Fiqar, la saifa illa Dhul Fiqar. That there is no sword like the sword of Dhul Fiqar. Dhul Fiqar, there's many variations. Some look like that, the little pointy one and whatnot. There's different opinions about the sword and what, how the sword of the Prophet was. Okay, so for those who want to see it. The blessed armor of the Prophet Zubair bin al-Awwam who know what was this what was Zubair's relationship to the Prophet? Married to the Prophet's wife sister. What else do you know about Zubair bin al-Awwam? Tell me something else. He was a Mashara What else? He was adopted. He was what? Somebody say adopted? Yeah. No. Grandson of Allah. Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu the Prophet said a couple of things about him Hawari fil dunya that Isa al had Hawariyin helpers, assisters my assister my assistant not a sister assistant is Zubair ibn al-Awwam he was so big that when he sat on a horse his feet would almost touch the ground big guy his son Abdullah bin Zubair what can you tell me about him? Okay. He was a Muslim, he was a human being, he <laughs> ate food, he drank water. He was the first Sahabi born in Medina. His first Sahabi born in Medina, what else about him? Very brave. Very brave. Very brave? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, stood up to Hajjaj. he stood up to Hajjaj. He was a Khalifa for a certain time. For those who've been to Mecca, again, if you go Hadi Umrah with Caravan, Hadi Umrah, we show these things to you. Uh, how many of you went from the area where Baba Malik Fahad is and went to Masjid Aisha to put your haram on? Raise your hand if you've done that. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna delve into your memory for a second. As you are driving on that road, it's a straight road. As you are going there, you cross a street called are called Shari Shuhada or Tariq Shuhada, the street of martyrs, and there is a pausage there, a fried chicken place. Yes. <laughs> You can say yes or no. I mean, no. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not going to fact check you on it. Uh, there's a thazaj there. That is the location of where Abdullah bin, uh, Zubair, uh, Abdullah bin Zubair was hung over there. Uh, he was hung and his grave is close by over there. And that thazaj area was where he was hung. I know I, A lot of these things I know this is because my father actually, uh, this is his, what, 30 something number hajj. Uh, he's done a lot of hajj. He's seen... The, the, the masjid before all these expansions and whatnot. You know, since the 70s, he's been going there. Uh, so a lot of things he knows from people who either, either he's witnessed it himself or people who've witnessed it uh, from, uh, witnessed it and he, and he learned it from them. He's actually coming in tomorrow from New Jersey. And tomorrow after Isha is a Hajj seminar uh, in Madrasa Islamia. It's free, it's open to all. So if you're interested in coming, he has a lot of experience um, in regards of Hajj and he's done many of Hajj with many people and. He's, he's this phenomenal individual uh, uh, in, in terms of Hajj because he, he does it with a passion. He just doesn't do it as a business. He does it as, as a service for the community. Uh, so I do uh, tell everyone that please do try to come tomorrow for the program. 745. 745 is Isha Was Zubair bin Alam one of the ones that opposed Ali radiallahu anh, during his Khalafa? Yes. Jum yes. Jum yes. Jum with Aisha radiallahu anh. These are Mashad al Sahaba. They're human beings at the end of the day. Right? They had differences. They had their own personal uh, uh, squabbles. Uh, but they were great men. And great men, Allah's not going to look upon what their squabbles were. Allah made them live in a certain era for a certain reason. Not to punish them, but to elevate them. The Prophet wasallam wore two suits of armor. Shows how thin the armor was. Uh, Dawood was the first person to wear chainmail, and he invented chainmail. Uh, fun fact. What? The chainmail. Anyone knows what chainmail is? 
Yeah. It's like a little medieval armor. Things because it's light to wear. Try to stop someone. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam intended to climb a hill, but since it was huge due to the heavy weight of the two armors and the difficulties, he, con he was confronted, causing his auspicious face to bleed. As a result, he could not do so. He therefore requested Talha radiallahu anhu to sit and with his aid climb the hill. Zubair radiallahu anhu said. I heard the Prophet of Allah say, it has become wajib on, Jan on Talha. <clears throat> and I'm going to end off with this. I'm going to mention the armor and I'm going to say one story. I'm going to end off with this. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam possessed seven suits of armor. The names of these are Dhatul Fadl, because of its size. It was well known by this name, as is mentioned in the books of Hadith. The armor was pawned to a Jew named Ab uh, Abdul Sh uh, Shaham. Dhatul Hawashi, Dhatul Wishah, Fida, Sardiya, Tabra, and Khanmaj. The different armors. So the Prophet of Allah, this hadith is in Bukhari. The Prophet of Allah is in Ahab. And the enemy arrows are being shot towards the Prophet. So Talha bin Ubaidullah who sees that, now what do I do? He says, Ya Rasulullah, come behind me, come behind me. So the Prophet of Allah is behind him, and Talha doesn't have a shield to deflect the arrows. So he goes to grab the arrows. And as each arrow is coming, you hear about people catching a touchdown pass. This man is grabbing a, you can, you can say he's grabbing a bullet in his hand. And as each arrow comes, he would grab it. And as the arrow would pierce his hand, he would go for another arrow, another arrow. Until the, the person narrating the hadith says that the Prophet, that Talha bin Ubaidullah's hand became like a strainer with that many holes in it. And while each arrow was piercing him, all the Prophet was saying in the back was, Wajabat ya Talha, Wajabat ya Talha, Wajabat, Jannah is wajib, Jannah is wajib, Jannah is wajib. When you're hearing the guarantee of Jannah behind you, then it doesn't matter what's happening in front of you. When you hear about the guarantee of Jannah coming from behind you, it doesn't matter what comes in front of you, because it's only going to be a blessing after that. May Allah SWT give one and all the ability to act on what has been said. Uh, understand it? Any questions? I have a question. Prophet Sallallahu did Janaza for Hercules. Najashi. Najashi. He did in absentia because he, although he didn't declare as a Muslim, but he knew his heart was in Islam. He did. Can you do that today if you know somebody is inclined towards Islam? He has never declared as a Muslim in maybe in Jew or Hindu country or something like that. If you know for sure, can you do uh, in absentia the janaza? Uh, so Najashi's iman was known, well known. Number one, number two. Even if there was a discussion about Najashi's iman being ambiguous, Allah had informed the Prophet about the iman, right? So that's that's concrete knowledge. Um, and salatul janaza is special for the Muslims, right? It's a specific action that is done uh, for the Muslims for the burial of the Muslims. And as far as Najashi, Salat al Janazah is concerned, what actually took place was that the Prophet was in Medina, Allah informed him that Najashi passed away. So Allah removed the curtain or veil between him and Abyssinia. So the grave and the body of Najashi appeared in front of the Prophet. So there's different opinions on the Prophet was seeing it or it was brought close or whatever the case was, and the Prophet did Salat al Janazah al Ghaib. Based on this, there's a difference of opinion that can you even do Salat of Janaza al Ghaib for a Muslim or not? So the Shawafir say yes, you can. The Shafi'i say you can because the Prophet did it for Najashi. The Hanafi say no, you can't. Is because the Prophet only did it once. There were so many other people that passed away. There was Jafar, there was uh, uh, Jafar Tayyar, Abdullah ibn Rawaha. There were so many Sahaba that passed away. The Prophet didn't do Salat of Janaza for anyone. Why Najashi? They said it was a speciality, number one. Number two, Allah brought the grave in front of him. So when he brought it in front of him, it's not for a ghaib anymore. <laughs> this is because it's a halid, it's in front of him. So it's not for a ghaib anymore. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is actually a discussion, uh, a fiqhi discussion, uh, in regards to whether you can pray for ghaib or not. One of my teacher's teacher, Sheikh Abdul Hassan Ali al Nadwi, rahimahullah, a great scholar, phenomenal individual, for those who know him, they know that he was a man that King Faisal would fly in to discuss Arabic. He was from the Indian uh, country. Uh, and um, when this man passed away, it was the 27th of Ramadan, he passed away in India. My father was there in, in, in Makkah Mukarram at that time. Sheikh Subay, the Imam of Salah, he said, before I lead the Salah of Janazah on these dead people today, I will lead the Janazah of Sheikh Abdul Hassan Ali al who passed away in India. 
This is one of the few times that they did Salat al al ghaib uh, in the Haram itself. So in Mecca and Medina, Salat al al ghaib was prayed for the Shaykh Abdul Hassan Ali and Abdul And again, someone's parent passes away and you want to pray or someone's family friend <coughs> passes away, you can technically do it. It's not that you're going to get a sin or something for it. It's, it's nothing that's, that is, uh, for example, my grandfather passed away and I wasn't able to go for his janazah. So I prayed his salat al janazah al-ghaib even though I don't, this is, not, this is not my general opinion. I don't conform to this opinion, but I did it as a form of nafil. Anyone else? Mashallah. Really, you don't have any questions. I'll put on the spot. Next week, inshallah. Yeah.